Good evening and welcome. The Tuesday, January 16th, 2018 Board of Commissioner meeting is now in session. The Reverend Jerry Cribb has been kind enough to come and give us the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could all rise. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to honor you today. We come to acknowledge that you are the only one who can rightly lead and guide this meeting of our commissioners this evening and those citizens who gather. We ask for, to receive insight and direction. We ask that you bless our commissioners with your wisdom and compassion as they listen and make decisions that guide and direct the wonderful people of Currituck County. Together, may all of us who are gathered here remember to give you thanks for our blessings of life and liberty. In your beloved son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Reverend Cribb. First item this evening is approval of the agenda. I do have uh, one addition. Uh, we will have a closed session, which we will put after the county manager's report. Mr. Chairman, make a motion for approval with that addition. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on, uh, public comment. Uh, this evening I have Barbara Snowden, if you please come forward. Good evening. My name is Barbara Snowden, and I live at 154 Courthouse Road. I was out of town last, uh, your, at your last meeting, but I understand that each one of you received a copy of the survey book uh, of Curry Tech County. And I wanted to come here tonight to tell everybody who is listening uh, to this report and seeing it a little bit about this book. The book started, would you believe, 2002, when Currituck County decided to have a complete building survey of the county. They hired two people, uh, Meg Malvasi, who is an architectural historian, to ride down every single road in Currituck County and map code any building that was 50 years old uh, to make comments on the ones that they, she thought were of <coughs> historical importance. On the Outer Banks, a lady by the name of Penny Sandbeck was hired by the Outer Banks conservationists to do exactly the same thing. And this book is a combination of that, those two ladies' work, plus some additional history that I added to, to the book. I know it's a, I think it is a very nice looking book and I know all of you will enjoy looking at the pictures, but I would like to encourage each one of you to actually read the text and find out about some of the buildings in our county, plus finding out about the history of the county. The book starts out talking about Curry Tuck and Dare County because Dare County was part of Curry Tuck till we get all the way down to 1870 and then part of it continued to 1914, and so there are certain parts we'll be talking about the book about, or you'll say, well, that's not in Currituck, that's in Dare. Well, that's on purpose, because that was part of Currituck at that time. We bring the history all the way down to the current time, and we hope that people will enjoy reading it. It is available, and this is the commercial part of my presentation. The book is available at all three libraries in Currituck County, the Chamber of Commerce, and for members of the Curry Tech County Historical Society. And we hope the people in the county will be pleased with what the work that we have done and will enjoy this book. And that was my point for coming here tonight. Sorry I could not be here last time at your meeting. And also I hope you enjoyed your cupcake starting the 350th. Uh, as Dan can tell you, this is our first project of the 350th, but we didn't intend for it to be at the 350th. It took a lot longer to get it published than we had originally planned. And I'll be glad to answer any questions about the project or the book, if you have any. 
Ms. Snowden, I don't have any questions, but I just have to thank you for all of your efforts and, and the knowledge that you've brought forward and, and just your energy. I just, I can't thank you enough for all that you've done and, and whoever's, uh, the little elves that helped you. Okay. But thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I'm reaching the age where my energy is going very fast. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Snowden. Moving on to administrative reports. Uh, Trillium Annual Report, Mr. Bland Baker's here. I want to take this opportunity to thank um, the Commissioner Board, thank um, Mr. Chairman um, for allowing me to come and uh, make this presentation for what we've been doing this past year. Also want to thank him publicly, Commissioner Hannig, for uh, serving on my advisory board, and how well he represents Curry Tuck County. So I do, I do appreciate that. I did and not I pay will, him to say that. <laughs> I will be, I will be as brief as I can, just hitting the highlights. So um, our mission has not changed, continues uh, to be, we're transforming the lives of the people that we provide services for by providing ready access to quality care. Um, it's a really simple mission, but it's becoming more and more difficult for us to do. Um, that's based on budget cuts. It's not only on Trillium, but all the other MCOs in North Carolina, with the continued budget cuts from the state and federal government, from, um, I suppose, the Medicaid reform as it continues to move upon us. Um, Within five years, the MCO may not even exist. So we're trying to change, evolve, so we can meet the needs of the folks that we serve and to also meet our contractual obligations with the, the, uh, the state as well. So one of the things that we've done this year, which is one of the biggest things <laughs> we have in preparation for Medicaid reform in November, we actually made an announcement that we were going to form a partnership with two other MCOs, uh, Alliance uh, MCO, which is in um, the Piedmont area around Raleigh, um, and then with Via Health, which is in the western part of the state, which kind of gives us representation across North Carolina. Um, we've actually formed a website, which you see on your screen, and it's called AdvancingNorthCarolinaWholeHealth.com. We will uh, periodically be posting um, questions for questions and answers on that website as we move forward. And what we're trying to do, we decided to come together. Again, this is not a merger. It's a partnership. We are still three individual agencies, and we'll continue to operate that way. But we're very similar in our perspectives and the way we do business and the way we try to provide services to the folks in our communities. So we thought um, what better way to do than to come together, put our strengths together, um, lessons learned, and as we try to move forward from Medicaid reform. So last year, you know, uh, we were 24 counties, 1,260,800 approximately, uh, population in our 24 counties, and uh, that's 185 Medicaid eligibles in those 24 counties. But in July, Nash County wanted to join with Trillium. So that did happen July 1, which brought our population uh, up to 1,355,000 and then 195 in Medicaid eligibles. We continue to do a needs and gaps analysis every year and is posted on our website. Um, it becomes more and more challenging as we look at our needs and gaps and what it shows and then how to figure out how we can satisfy those gaps, what we can do to kind of narrow those gaps. So that's, that becomes a challenge as our budget cuts continue to come. But that is on our website for, um, for folks to view. So last year we served 52,650 people 79% of those folks had mental health issues, 19% of those had substance abuse issues, and then 9% had intellectual and developmental disabilities. The cost of those services was $355 million, approximately, give or take. 
and we have 429 providers across our um, our 25 counties. Um, just so you know, in our 10 counties, which is where this area is, we have 72 providers across our 10 counties that are providing services. Uh, one of the other things that Trillium does every year, we, we put together some initiatives and some, some priorities so our staff knows what direction we, we want to take. Um, they're listed here for you, every person first, every time. We try to look at activities uh, within our system, within our call center that um, improves our customer service to anybody who calls into um, our agency. Uh, the 2020 vision, uh, we are mostly interested in evidence-based practices, services that we can bring into the community that is evidence-based, which means that we know that if you provide this service in this way, you can expect certain outcomes. So evidence-based practices is always the best way to go because you kind of know uh, what you're going to get if the service is provided as it should and your outcomes are so much better. Um, we are looking at uh, technology. Um, we actually have this year done a lot towards advancing our technology, using that in different ways. Um, as we, as our system, as the world gets more technologically savvy, we're trying to do the same thing. I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Um, one community together, we try very hard through our advisory boards to be sure that they address the, the needs and the services in each of our counties is addressed. Um, the also in the system of care, um, the system of care, each county has a system of care coordinator assigned to that county and they have uh, monthly meetings. They look at the service gaps and the needs of the children in each of those counties. And then of course the last thing is um, just working together among ourselves as an agency to improve our communication among each other so that we're functioning um, at our highest level. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the opioid crisis because that's on everybody's mind. That's uh, what everybody's talking about. That's what the government's talking about. Um, North Carolina received $31 million um, this year and next year across these um, two years. Um, to address the opioid crisis in, uh, through the Cures Act. So our allocation for this year, this past and this year now, up until July 1, was $1.2 million. The state gives you that money, but they never tell you how you're going to spend it. So what we've had to spend that money on has been any new people in treatment who have never sought treatment in any type of... Um, substance use, specifically opioids before, or any individual that has been in service, they have relapsed or dropped out, it's been three months since they have had any services and then they come back in. So that $1.2 million has been designated for those individuals. As of December, we had already spent all of our $1.2 million. We've served 1,269 new consumers. So um, we're waiting to see if any more money will uh, come forward. I know that um, the Division of Mental Health has held back some money, so it could be we may get some more money before July 1. We'll just have to wait and see. I don't know how much that will be or if it will be any. We should get another allocation at least by July for the next fiscal year. So some of our initiatives are specifically about opioids. And these initiatives are also in our reinvestment plan. So, because I'll talk about that in just a minute as well. So, for healing transitions, um, that is a peer run inpatient facility in Raleigh. And we bought some beds, <coughs> reinvestment money, so we'd have some additional places to send folks who need inpatient treatment. Um, so, we had 354 admissions from our Trillium catchment area last year. Um, who were looking for long-term uh, peer-led treatment for substance use disorders. I think the, the statistics show people who go through that particular treatment program is about a 70% um, 
success rate for people that stay uh, sober or clean for at least a year after their, uh, they go through the program. The Oxford Houses, we've contracted with the Oxford House to actually uh, develop sober living situations for folks who are coming out of long-term treatment. Uh, we serve 242 people in those homes across our 24 counties. We're continuing to open those homes. The, the closest one to Curry Tuck is in Elizabeth City. Um, it opened um, in August, I believe, and they are currently looking for a woman's um, home as well. So, and I want to say, just because it's in Elizabeth City does not mean that the folks in Curry Tuck don't have access to those services. Um, they have to be really strategic in their planning for those houses because you have to have, um, because of the way the house is set up, the people who live there have to support the home, they have to pay rent, they have to have a job, so the job market's got to be there, there's got to be some kind of public transportation system for folks to get to their jobs, so that dictates sometimes where those houses are, but um, if someone coming out of treatment happens to um, be from Currituck County, they could just as easily have a bed in Elizabeth City as anyone else. So. North Carolina harm reduction, we actually um, have distributed over 2,245 kits to our law enforcement and our EMS folks. Um, I know that um, Currituck County has been in, uh, a recipient of some of those kits. Um, I know that the person at the North Carolina Harm Reduction did call the sheriff and, and talk to her about getting some kids. And so, um, let's see. And so I want to talk a little bit about the initiatives um, that we've looked at in advancing technology. You know, we have, a, we have a Facebook page, we do Twitter. We've invested in a comprehensive assessment for teens. Uh, what we found out is that teens, when, if they can go on a tablet, and do their assessment, even to send the, cl the clinician's office, if they can do that assessment, they're more likely to self-disclose any type of uh, use of drugs or experimentation than they are if they tell you face-to-face. -face. We actually contracted with a number of our providers across our, our counties, bought tablets for them, and then had them trained on this particular assessment. Crisis Chat is another um, way we've tried to reach out um, this is in, um, in conjunction with Integrated Family Services, who is the mobile crisis provider in this area. Crisis Chat is an online place that you can go anonymously if you choose to actually talk to a clinician who will, who will chat back with you. If you've had a bad day, if you're being bullied, if you just need somebody to talk to, um, you go to Crisis Chat. They've been implemented in our school systems, be it the rack cards have been given, I know, in Currituck County, um, so that to give kids more access to reach out to other ways that they can maybe seek help. Assistive technology, um, we continue to offer, I guess, grants or scholarships to individuals that are on the wait list um, for, say, communication devices for folks with intellectual developmental disabilities security type systems, um, it purchases um, pill dispensers that are on automatic for those folks who need, need help in that, and then any kind of adaptive equipment. We, we have bought um, these types of systems for individuals who are on the wait list for um, innovation services. Then the access point is uh, another way um, through the kiosk, which there's, we put one here in Currituck County at the library. I did not get, the, I couldn't get the, the figures of where you all are at this point and how, how often it's been used, but um, I'll give that to Commissioner Hannick and then he can report that back to you. But it's a website, it screens, um, it's a kiosk, but it's also a website. So you can sit in your living room and go to that website and does the same thing as with the kiosk. So it's anonymous. There have been some, in a way, maybe some criticism. Well, you don't know if you've reached anybody or not. Because if they don't call the call center after they have taken the screening, then you don't know. But the fact that they actually went on the kiosk or went to the website and took a screening 
that was the whole point, to reach out to individuals who may initially don't want to call anybody. So um, we do keep um, data on that information. We know how many screenings from the website have been done by county. We know there are eight different screenings. Uh, they screen for depression. Um, they screen for um, alcohol, drug abuse, suicidal ideations, um, several different diagnoses. So we can take a look and see what people are being screened for, but you can't see who that person is. But if you're at a kiosk and you take a screening and you decide you can pick up the phone and it dials the call center immediately. So you can get an appointment then, or you can um, not call for an appointment at that point, but you can still, on the website, it takes you to our provider directory. You can search by county, by zip code, so you can see what services are available, how close they are to you. So it, it, it's been received really well in, in our counties. Um, some of the other things, in addition to the things I've just mentioned that were part of our reinvestment um, projects and plans is the um, summer after school program, the closest one to Currituck County is in Elizabeth City. Um, this is for folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, they had um, seven after school programs across our area and 12 um, summer day programs serving 380 youth and then 218 in the after school program. Some of the programs have added an adult component as well and that's going very well. And of course, you know about the playgrounds. That's now come to an end. But um, that was in this past year. We had a couple to finish. So um, we've done evidence-based uh, services. It's child first. It's in this county. Um, we actually contracted with three, three providers. We trained the clinicians um, on how to provide the service. We've actually served so far 926 children um, in that service. We picked that service because it's evidence-based. We brought it to North Carolina. And we picked it because that was a gap from zero to six. There was no services in our service array that covered kids that age. So we picked that and brought it to North Carolina. And now other MCOs are being able to add that service to their service array as well. We've actually written the service definition so that you can build Medicaid for that service. So that's being opened up uh, to other MCOs. Um, Compassion Reaction was um, Rachel's challenge. We did that year before last in the high schools, and then we did it in the elementary schools as well. We served 289 schools, and 136,000 kids participated in that. Um, wellness Recovery Action Planning. We actually contract with Recovery International. They do... Um, wellness classes, they're evidence-based classes for individuals um, in the community. It's no cost to them. Um, they provide those services in all of our counties. Um, they Sometimes they'll do it at libraries, so may, they may do it at a community center. Um, they teach eight different curriculums. Um, and this is, we look at it, this way is a way of reaching people. Sometimes um, some type of treatment doesn't work for some folks. Going into a setting, sitting down and talking to a therapist face to face, but getting in a group and having maybe uh, group sessions and learning what it means to be well, what, what it looks like, um, those are the kind of things that they talk about. So those, those services are contracted with recovery. There's no charge to the uh, consumer to take part in that. So those are just some of our reinvestment projects. Um, we spent a total of $34 million on those projects. We had um, we reserved $64 million for our reinvestment projects. Some of them had to come to an end because as when I was here last time, we were talking about the state taking our money. So they actually took $53 million between the last two years and these two coming up. 
The one thing that they did listen to us when I was here before asking for your help was that they did take a look into consideration all that we had reinvested in our community. And so we only got cut 17 million this time coming up. And some of the MCOs got cut as much as 44 million. So, so this is just state money. This is not Medicaid. This is just state money. So with your support and your help, they at least listened to us, I think. And so we've had to take what we were using for our reinvestment money and we had to make it up in services where they had taken our money. So just kind of so you know where it, all that is. So, so for Curry Tuck County specifically, um, last year we served 712 consumers or individuals. 549 of those um, had mental health struggles. 118 of those um, had substance abuse issues. And nine of those individuals had intellectual and developmental disability issues. So that's about as quick as I can do it. <laughs> um, Y'all got any questions for me? I don't have any questions. Just, just thank you. Um, I know the struggles you go through on a daily basis, and your group's tireless efforts are amazing. Thank well, you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to old business, consideration and action PB 17-15 Currituck County, Currituck County request to amend the Unified Development Ordinance to update Chapter 10 definitions and measurements, subsection 1036 height to clarify the size and placement of appurtenances, including church spires, belfries, cupolas, and domes. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ms. LeCicero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the text amendment you have uh, before you tonight um, I'm going to give you a little background information on, on uh, why we're asking for this, but it is staff initiated. Uh, <coughs> currently, our UDO uh, has a, a height limitation of 35 feet um, for, for all buildings. That's a mean height, so it can the total roof line can be up into the low 40s. Um, but our, the way the UDO is written, we exempt things such as cupolas, um, belfries, church spires, and I items like that are exempt from this 35-foot um, uh, height limitation. And, and I'll thank uh, Commissioner uh, Bob White for these pictures. But on the beach in Corolla, we're seeing, as you know, houses getting larger. Um, and they are using a cupola um, to work around that height limitation. Um, this is a picture of Pine Island Reserve where you can see a, some regular normal-sized um, shaped cupolas. And then you see other cupolas that are getting bigger um, and essentially, like I said, exceeding our height limitation. Um, and here, you, There's plans here. There's another example of, of some of the things that staff's getting, and these are labeled cupolas. Um, and you see this area right here that's in the cloud. Um, we have an architect and a builder claiming that this is a cupola. Um, and this also, this is, I'm not sure, one is the front and one is the rear of, of the building. So it's got at least two cupolas. And then you get to the side and it's, there's three cupolas this here. So they're expanding this, you know, they're expanding the height. Uh, and, and these appurtenances on these buildings are often flush with the front wall of the structure, or in this case, extend um, the rear wall of the structure, not what we kind of envision as cupolas. Um, so I uh, brought language before you last time, and um, we tweaked it upon your recommendation. So um, the definition of a cupola is uh, a dome-like structure on the top of a roof to, for ventilation or to let in air. and um, since we don't really have any standards for that, um, for a cupola, they're being, our flexibility of the ordinance is being maximized. So uh, we've brought back language um, that we've tweaked, and uh, essentially the breakdown of it is that uh, a cupola, at the language that we have before you, um, a cupola can be 10% of the roof, of the footprint of the roof, uh, or 200 square feet, whichever is less. Um, the cupola cannot be part of the outside wall, which you see here and here. It, is has, and it has to sit 
on top of the roof, like this one here, um, and it can also not be taller than 15 feet from the tallest roof ridge line. So um, that's the uh, text amendment that's uh, before you tonight. And I'll be glad to answer any questions about that. I have one question for now. Um, does it make sense that there be a limit of one? Um, we staff talked about that, and that's um, as we saw, like in the boat building, where <coughs> these are going to be smaller cupolas. But if that they can have more than one, as long as they stay under that ten percent or the the two hundred square feet, because there may be different areas of the house that would want to have ventilation or that type of light. Got it. <coughs> On page 10, uh, B, it, it does not exceed the maximum height of 200 feet above grade. Can you explain 200 feet? Um, essentially, once you get past 200 feet, you're um, dealing with the, uh, the FAA, that, and you require a blinking red light at the minimum on, on things like that. Do we have many of those that go with houses? Aren't those usually something like towers or buildings? Of Typically, they're, you know, they're the towers, the um, cell towers. Nobody's trying to put towers. that into a house. Nobody's trying to put that into a house. That's. Yeah. Okay. That's. And when they do, we'll approach that. <laughs> well, that, this, this 200 foot, uh, I think we're dealing more with a commercial setting, like a church spire. Is that kind of why that's in there? Correct. We okay. pulled um, a church, this definition, that was another. Um, uh, Confusing. Requirement that uh, or with, uh, issue that we talked about at the last meeting was that we wanted to um, pull church spires out of this, and, and that 200 feet is um, would be more so towards the commercial. Okay. All right. So in the area of the base of the appurtenances shall not singularly or collectively exceed 10 percent of the footprint. So in the case of like the the um, the boathouse. There was three or four cupolas on there. They would have easily exceeded 10 percent um, of the roof. I'm guessing, maybe, maybe not, depending on how big they were. That and that kind of goes to was that what? No, I I don't know if there's a height issue with those. Well, not not necessarily that, but um, 10 percent of the footprint. So the 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 size of the of the cupola can be either 200 square feet, a maximum of 200 square feet, or you can have three of them if they total 200 square feet. Correct. Okay. So, and although I'm not an architect, they maybe they were getting close to 10%, but that building was also very large. Um, and, you know, 10% of, of, like, let's say 5,000 square feet um, yeah. would be the 200 square feet total. Mm -hmm. So I think... If that if we need to to look at something like that for the specifically for the boat building, we can um, come back. But to me, when I was looking at that, because I was concerned when I saw that, I feel like that 200 square feet would those cupolas would fall into that category. Okay, we look good with the cupolas. That's what I'm asking. I don't want to see it go away. <laughs> right, right. Miss that, 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 but that's only if we have a building that's maxing out on height. In other words, if I have a one-story building, can I have 400 feet of cupolas. No. It's not a cupola. No. But so, so it doesn't matter. The 35 feet has nothing to do with it. It's whether you're a one-story building or a three-story building. That's correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah the, the 35 foot only comes in when you're dealing with the maximum height, right. medium height. So you're looking at, sure. it would put it up at 40, 50 feet. Whatever. That's my thing. I just want to make sure when somebody comes in and says, well, I don't have a 35 foot, three-story building. I have a one-story. Yeah, so but I think. <laughs> that would be a spire. Because knowing the way the game works, they'll call it. A uh, raised ceiling, <laughs> right? I, yeah. I mean, because I get to the, the, where the cupolas are coming into play is when the roof line has reached its maximum height, and they're using the cupolas to go up even higher. So I think in that case, I think you're going to be, yeah, with seating okay. and everything else. Yeah. No, it's for light. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, okay. And ventilation. Okay. The, the, walkway, the walkway yeah. so you can get up there to yeah, open the windows yeah, for ventilation. That's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ms. LaCicero, uh, D, could you just explain a little bit better for me I'm, what, what that's meaning there on page 10, number D? Number D. 
or letter. Yeah. Excuse is that the complies with screening requirements? <laughs> Are you looking at the screening requirements? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. I'm sorry. Mechanical equipment um, on page 10, letter D. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, explain to me what that was referring to again or meaning. Um, I don't have that. The you don't have? The well, so it's, it's, it's ordinance. that ordinance. The ordinance. Item number D. It's already in there. I just. No, no, it's not in there. One yeah, it's already there. What? Yeah. Complies with the screening requirements for mechanical equipment and appurtenances in this ordinance. Correct. We, um, when mechanical equipment is on, on on the roof, there it's required to be screened. So, like your HVAC or things like that. So. Okay. So, so, so you want that to comply with the screening of the equipment? Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. So it's not a coupon. So yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then it's an appurtenance. <laughs> Any further questions for Ms. LaCicero? <laughs> With that, open the floor for a motion. Um, uh, this is just a simple motion to approve, is that correct, or do we need to have a <coughs> founding effect? We do, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll move for approval on PB 17-15 because it is consistent with the land use plan and that it establishes a standard for architectural feature based upon the actual nature of the structure rather than the label attached to it. Policy OB3. The request is reasonable and in the public interest because it establishes a maximum size for a cupola in order for house designs to adhere to height regulations of the Unified Development Ordinance. Mr. I'll Chairman, second I'll second that. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to new business, consideration and action, PB 17-08, Connect Currituck Pedestrian Master Plan. Without hand it over to Ms. LaCicero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what's before you tonight uh, for adoption is uh, Connect Currituck, the pedestrian master plan that we've been um, working on um, since April of this year. A little bit of project background. In uh, two. North Carolina DOT has a pedestrian planning branch, and they give out grants to local governments to plan for pedestrian and, uh, and bicycle accommodations within that local government. Um, in 2015, the pedestrian program was opened up to counties with small populations, um, specifically in uh, 25,000 people, and, and since I think that threshold's been moved. Um, we did apply for that in 2015, the end of 2015, and in March of 2016, um, we were awarded the first pedestrian plan planning grant uh, for a county. We began the planning process in uh, 2017. Um, so some of the key benefits in planning for uh, pedestrian um, facilities, um, economics. Um, within this plan, you see that there's been some um, increase in, in property values when you have good pedestrian facilities. It increases um, our, um, our health. I think um, in, in the plan there was a, um, a fact that um, for every three dollar, that for every one dollar you um, put towards bike and pedestrian facilities, you see a three dollar direct cut in your medical costs. Um, a safety, We've, we all know there's, we have safety issues when it comes to pedestrians in this county. Um, mobility to give people another opportunity, another way to travel. Um, not just get in their car, but give them an opportunity to walk to different places. And, and stewardship. Um, the, less, the less we drive in our cars, the, the less pollution we have. Um, and also we, for greenways and other pedestrian type facilities, are often near water, along streams. Um, keep those clean with the buffers that pedestrian facilities require. So these are some of the key benefits that um, planning for uh, pedestrian facilities kind of hits on. So in this planning process, um, it was a long, I don't want to say it was long, but it was a, um, a pretty intense process. We, we had a steering committee. Um, we had four meetings of the steering committee. Steering committee members were um, county staff, um, DOT staff attended. Um, public health staff. We had several citizens involved, but it was essentially like a 20-member uh, steering committee. Um, and we had um, public workshops and outreach. We did an online 
web uh, survey, we had a website, and we had over 350 uh, surveys, online surveys, um, completed. So we, the consultant and county staff, um, we had a kickoff, and they took, the consultants took our existing plans, um, some of our existing uh, conditions, we call them, populations, um, commercial areas, um, and did and did what we called existing conditions uh, to, with that, and then we had the first, first steering committee uh, meeting. In June, um, we had a, a week-long charrette when the consultant came here. Uh, the steering committee had two meetings, and we went through opportunities and constraints of here, of this area. We did, a, we did um, public workshops. We had focus groups for different areas of the county. We, um, we went to the YMCA. We had a public outreach, YMCA, the Food Line and Grandy, the Food Line and Moyoc. Um, and we went to Wine Wednesday at, in Kerala and the uh, 5K that they have there to getting public input. Um, they drafted the plan, and in September, I think it was September this, this past fall, we held a work session with the Board of Commissioners and the planning board members to, to work through to have the consultant come and present um, our draft uh, plan. Um, we took some feedback that we heard from the planning board and the board of commissioners, uh, made those edits, and what you have here is the, the final plan before you tonight. So um, this is the public outreach summary again. Um, the steering committee, the stakeholders, uh, the general public, so it was a pretty public um, uh, public input intense plan. So a little bit of uh, about the survey and what we received, we had a, a huge, uh, a large percentage coming from the mainland that participated in this survey. Um, Seven percent were from Kerala, Virginia, and Dare County. Um, they we had three percent of those respondents. And, uh, and not silent had 2%. But the majority of our respondents were from the mainland. And, and that was a point of this plan is to address not only Kerala, but also the mainland, because we do have um, pedestrians and incidents here on the mainland as well. <clears throat> um, this was one of the most telling uh, statistics or questions that came out of, of, the, of the survey is 63% of the respondents said that there are no sidewalks leading to the places that I want to go. I know we're a rural county, and, and, and staff really thought that, that places that I want to go too far would be a lot higher, but that's way down here at the bottom. There are no sidewalks in the places that I want to go, 63%. You know, the top three or four um, survey responses here, well, they were really, really telling to me. Roads and intersections do not feel safe for walking. Motor vehicles travel at high speeds, and there's too much traffic. Um, and there are no cross signals, crosswalks or pedestrian signals to get across the street. So um, this is the responses from one of the survey questions uh, that I feel is very telling about our um, pedestrian facilities here on the mainland in Curry Tuck. So I'm going to go through the plan briefly um, and uh, hope to give you some highlights of it. So that chapter one is introduction, chapter two, uh, existing conditions, chapter three, the programs, different programs that we can do to educate um, you know, everyone, all road users. Um, chapter four are some policy recommendations, some policy things that we can do. Uh, chapter five is the fun one, is the recommendations of actual projects, and chapter six is the implementation chapter. Uh, chapter one, this is the, the introduction. Um, our vision statement for the plan is Curry Tuck County is a destination where pedestrian connectivity and access is provided to people of all ages, abilities, and socioeconomic backgrounds, and where walking is encouraged and supported to create a healthy, prosperous, and livable Curry Tuck for, visitor, for residents and visitors alike. So the point of the goals of this plan are to improve pedestrian access. Um, to promote equity, that we're being fair to all users of the pedestrian facilities, that we create a positive economic impact, we enhance health, we protect the environment, and we increase safety for pedestrians. Uh, chapter two is existing conditions. Um, and we are a county, and we're a rural county, um, and this is the, 
the first pedestrian plan that DOT funded for a county. Um, so because of our geography um, and just the scope and the scale of working with the county, we broke, we broke it up into four hubs and two sub-hubs. Um, four major hubs, the Moyoc area, M Maple Barco area, the Grandy area, and the Corolla area. And the two sub-hubs were the um, Jarvisburg Powell's Point area and Knott's Island to kind of break the county down into a little bit smaller areas that you could plan for um, and, and, and digest the information a little better. The consultant, this is a map that the consultant created, the pedestrian demand analysis. And this map took um, our areas, our po population areas, um, and overlaid that with the destinations, where are people going to go? Where do people want to walk to? They, schools and parks and shopping areas um, and government facilities. So with the population, you can see there would be pedestrian demand in the Moyoc area and around Grandy and down here in uh, Powell's Point and Harbinger down near the tip of the county and also in, in, in Corolla. We all know that Corolla has got a, a lot of uh, pedestrian activity. Um, and the existing conditions, unfortunately, we do, do have several uh, pedestrian collisions on this map. Um, and you can see, as this is from 2007 to 2014, uh, pedestrian crashes. And in that, if you look down at the bottom, there, this here is no, there was 75, 72% of these accidents, there were no uh, pedestrian controls present. So... This is another map that they used to create our existing conditions, looked at. And another uh, analysis the consultant ran was uh, equity analysis, equity analysis to make sure that we are serving um, or trying to uh, serve all populations fairly. <coughs> this uh, looks at um, houses, houses, housing, households below the poverty level, um, households. So good. Using census data, they looked at um, uh, Households with uh, with no car or limited car access. Um, they looked at um, um, uh, where English is a second language, and, and once again back to the poverty. Uh, and these are the hot spots um, that came out. There's some areas in the middle of the county near Shawboro, um, and, and down in the lower part of the county that um, are. These are vulnerable populations and need pedestrian facilities. Uh, in Chapter 3, the, um, the plan goes in and lists some programs that the county can take part of to, uh, to help educate our pedestrians, our drivers, to everyone uh, to use our roads safely. Um, Let's Go and See is, is, is one. Um, we are, Corolla is... Um, Watch for Me and See is a participant in Watch for Me and See, and Active Routes Active Routes to and at school um, is a way to for kids to feel comfortable um, to encourage kids to walk and bike to school and at school. In Chapter Four, um, we got a list of um, uh, stat the consultant staff reviewed our ordinances, our code of ordinances, and our UDO and gave us a list of things where we can improve pedestrian facilities and pedestrian access by making some uh, improvements to our unified development ordinance. Um, we also talk about complete streets. They talk about complete streets in there, which is a NCDOT uh, program that for a new street design will take all users into account, transit, freight, pedestrians, bicyclists, and of course automobiles. Um, Vision Zero policies. Uh, Vision Zero is um, that we will have no fatalities on our roadways. That with better design, better education, um, that we can hopefully eliminate most um, fatalities on our, our roadways. And then Chapter Five is recommendations. Um, so we did. We got all the list of programs, all this list, a list of um, improvements that we can make to the UDO. Input from the public, input from the steering committee, um, field analysis, and where they came up with recommendation lists for us. So I'm going to go through those. Um, so all in all, 
this plan is um, has 16 new pro sidewalk pro sidewalk projects totaling 20 miles, new side path and tra trail 15 projects, 70 miles, quiet streets uh, 32 projects suggested of quiet streets 20 miles, um, the bridges, and then 38 uh, crossing improvements that we can make. Um, Moyak long term. Um, there is a side path that is projected for most of uh, Caratoke Highway, and you can see in here there are several um, crossings that need improvement in the Moyak area. Uh, they have recommended quiet streets within some of our neighborhoods in the Moyak area. And in um, the Maple Barco area, once again, the side path is recommended with numerous crossings um, throughout here at the at the intersection of 158 and 168 um, at the Maple Road um, and to make some connections between our existing facilities at the um, YMCA. Grandy long-term projects, um, a sidewalk along, prop, along Poplar Branch, the side path along Caratoke Highway, uh, quiet streets, potential for quiet streets within several of the neighborhoods within Grandy, and then numerous intersection improvements within Grandy. In Jarvisburg and Powell's Point area, um, some quiet streets recommendations uh, along some of the neighborhoods and several crossings improvements. Ms. Lesky, back up two strings real quick. Mm -hmm. One more. I guess you can blow that up. Is that, just looking at some of the streets in there, I guess some of the streets look like they're private developments. So you'd, you'd still put these pathways down in, in, in the private developments? Um, we could. Well, I mean, I, I didn't know if you were allowed to do that, okay. Well, just see, okay. well, this was when we would work with the neighborhoods. That's okay. I was just, yeah. Well, I was just curious because I'm looking at some of the developments right there. And, and this is, you know, this is long term. Um, big vision, you know, a plan that we can, you know, work with DOT on to get some of these uh, recommendations. That was that was my next that was my next thought was th these are probably DOT roads if they've been turned over. And so anyway. Yep. So right. And then Knotts Island, um, some crossing improvements and, and quiet streets uh, in, in in Knotts Island. Um, so these are long term, and then we have some short term priorities. Um, a big one in Moyak that we could work with DOT sooner um, would be the crossing at Camilla Drive and Caratoke Highway. Uh, right here is where the new uh, Dollar Tree is going down here in this lower corner. Have crosswalks and, and a pedestrian uh, signal timer. Turning lanes better defined. Um, this would be a, a short-term project for the Moyak area that came out of this plan. Uh, uh, crossings, another short-term project. Uh, the, our, our facility in, in Maple at the YMCA. Um, crosswalks there with the uh, handicap accessible accessibility. Ramps at the end. Uh, a Grandy, this is a great um, project I think for a short term is uh, pedestrians, pedestrian crossings, crosswalks, pedestrian timers and signalization and a also uh, right here a side path connecting where Poplar Branch comes into to Walnut, um, Walnut, Boulevard, Walnut Island Boulevard connecting these um, to get to you know this is and the consultants were here this was the most pedestrian traffic they saw okay. off of off of Kerala, away from Kerala. Um, so this would be uh, a short-term project for the mainland that we would like to see. Um, and then well, I, you heard me talk about quiet streets, um, and this is basically where we we change the striping. And this would be for neighborhoods where there's there's low volume of cars, um, and where. It just doesn't make sense to come in and put a five-foot sidewalk with curb and gutter 
you know, we're, you know, especially in, in our area where we're so limited by the water table in our, in our topography. Um, so this is where you could, you could share the road with the pedestrian and the cars. Uh, and like I said, it, it would only be in neighborhood roads and very low volume, low speed, low volume of traffic roads. Um, so, the, you know, once again, these are recommendations. <clears throat> and then the Corolla priority improvements, long term, uh, it, you know, it would be a goal to have um, the path, the Corolla Greenway on both sides of the road, all the way from the county line to essentially the, the ramp for the North Beach. Um, and that's a long term goal. And in the meantime, there are crossing improvements that can be made maybe some infill on, on the trail to make it a little bit more continuous. So we have both long-term and uh, short-term priority improvements in Corolla on this map. And then the Chapter 6 is the implementation chapter. Um, who's responsible for, for implementing this and the projects and securing the funding? Um, we do have a, a matrix from that for them, in the implementation. And also in that chapter, they give us a list of, of potential funding sources, which would be um, be accessible, you know, once we have our project done, once we move forward on a project. So that was a really brief rundown on our the pedestrian plan. If you have any specific questions, I will be glad to answer them. Ms. Lissister, I have a question. Um, how do you determine priority on projects? How would that be determined? That would be um, a staff and and planning board elected officials. We do have some uh, the priorities that I just listed out for the Grandy area, the crossings, and the Moyoc area. Those were recommended by the consultant um, that they should be short-term priorities, um, and they did give us a prioritized list that they saw. And this would be something that we would want to consult with um, with staff with other staff. Planning board elected officials to make sure that that prioritized list is the way we want to move forward. And I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, w I want to ask you that if you can talk to the purpose behind the, pr the plan, what that does for us with our relationship with DOT. Could, it, 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 can it, you speak to that, Mr. Scanlon? I'd like to speak to that because when, when this plan was first brought forward in a, in a draft form, uh, we received a lot of positive comments and, and several negative comments thinking that we were getting ready to embark on these multi-million dollar road projects and, and, and how we were going to do this and down. that tomorrow's staff was going to recommend a, a, a sidewalk from Virginia to, to, to the Dare County line. Um, I appreciate those comments. I, I appreciate people r r looking at the, the, the report, but assuming the board approves this, this document and, and now you have a uh, a, a pedestrian plan approved and adopted by the Board of Commissioners. It does several things. It helps us score higher when grant funds are made available because a project is consistent with a plan adopted by the Board of Commissioners. So we would use this to, to solicit either DOT grants or other grants uh, to do projects. Um, it helps when NCDOT is proposing to do road improvements. Uh, when they come in to, to improve shortcut road or they're going to do improvements to 168 and 158, if part of that you have in your document improved access control, improved intersections, or the suggestion that a, a, a side path be created, it can be integrated into the design and, and considered as part of that project cost when that project itself goes forward. As an approved plan, <coughs> you have a developer, a, a private entity standing in front of you with the project, Part of the consistency finding is, is it consistent with, with plans adopted by this board? Well, this is a plan adopted by the board, so you can work with uh, the commercial side and private developers that come to you with projects to, to put conditions on or to work with them so that their project is in furtherance of, uh, of this plan. So there's many different ways to see these projects realized outside of the county having to actually put funding in and actually undertaking the project. Uh, that is a possibility uh, as the board goes through there is, is if we have certain areas that we want to do elevate and prioritize as a project, but that is not something as we go into the budget right now that the staff is prepared to come back to you and start bringing you 
you know, all these different projects and start asking for a bunch of funding to put these in. The plan will predominantly be used in, in, in one of the first three manners of trying to, to, uh, to, to move the project forward. And as, as, as Lori mentioned, it's a long-term plan. You know, this, this is a vision over the next 20 or 30 years how we would like to see our transportation uh, system built out, including the, the pedestrian piece. So uh, multifaceted, but to, we'll use this as a tool to, uh, to leverage the best we can our resources and to get others to, uh, to help install this plan. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. That was the clarity I was looking for. I can tell you um, in Richmond, from Richmond to Williamsburg on Route 5, they put in a multi-use path and yeah. it is unbelievable how many people are on that <clears> thing and I've seen it yeah it's, it's pretty impressive so it it, it, cool. it, I mean, well, it sounds like a lot because it, it, it is a lot <coughs> it, it, if you see here today try to think about a a multi-use path from the virginia line <laughs> to the I mean, but you got to have the vision you you you've got to put it in a plan and you, you've got to start somewhere and I don't think anybody's anticipating that that project would be a single project. It, it will be built in segments as the population gets built, as, as infill comes in. Uh, but this would be the start of having that vision so that one day down the road, perhaps it's realized because you started that path today. So uh, uh, you, you mentioned something about, so if a, if a developer comes in and does a project and it, it fronts one of these roads, would we be? Could we ask them? I guess to put in a portion of the path along there, or their their portion of the roadway. Is that? I, part I of think it's you? part of the conversation you have with them. Yes. Okay. One of the things I did notice was uh, you had a committee up there where they put the new uh, Dollar Tree. They did put in sidewalks, which I thought was very unique. It's the only one there, yeah. but they already were planning ahead. I guess that's something you guys asked them to do. Yes, that is a, a requirement now in, in, in our unified development ordinance. Um, when new projects come in to have sidewalk, um, and, and, you know, this would be something that um, I think we could approach DOT in the next couple of years, um, that a project like here with some striping and some signalization um, that we could work with DOT on getting this sooner rather than later with the new sidewalks in place. Any further questions for Ms. LoCicero? With that, I'll open the floor for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve and adopt the PB 17-08 Connect Currituck Pedestrian Master Plan. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to board appointments. I understand there are several um, to go through this morning. Uh, Mr. Hall? With the Corova Beach Road Service District, I would like to recommend uh, Mr. Dixon, also known as Woody Dreyer. He lives up in the 4x4 area. He is an active member, and he usually offers solutions as well as pointing out anything that may be something we need to fix. So he's working from both sides, which is good for the county. Second that. We have a second from Mr. White. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Mr. Payment? Uh, yes, I, I've got a, um, unfortunately, the uh, one of our current tourism board, advisory board members is going to be leaving the area, I think, to Colorado, Colorado so she has resigned, and, um, and I've got a replacement for her. I spoke to uh, Sharon Price. She resides in Jarvisburg, longtime resident, business owner, and I'd like to... Um, um, ask the board to um, approve, unless there's some objection, Sarah, Sharon Price, to the advisory board position being vacated. And Mr. Chairman, I have an appointment also to tourism, so can we get this <coughs> together? And I have one as well. Go okay. ahead. I'd like to um, appoint Sophia Benowitz with the Weeping Radish. Nice. Okay. Um, I also have an appointment to tourism advisory board, uh, Doug Brindley. I'm sure everyone here knows who Doug is. Um, he served on tourism board before, and uh, is a fixture in Kerala and um, will be a huge asset to travel and tourism. I'll second that. Well, I have one too. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> I thought it was only We're going to knock this whole thing out tonight. Uh, we've got Todd Cartwright, a uh, longtime current resident, Kurtuck resident, and has worked for the last four years in Kerala in the tourism industry. So I think it'll uh, bring some valuable insight as well. I'll try seconding that again unless somebody else has to. <laughs> we have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Were there any more board appointments? Did I miss any? Fantastic. Moving on to consent agenda. Mr. Chairman, we have a Coastal Resource Advisory Council nominee. Oh, I apologize. I, I don't know who that is. I apologize. Chairman. I apologize. <laughs> I make a motion that we. Who's um, Ike? <laughs> Ike, could you please raise your hand? All right. I did ask if there were any more appointments. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Chair, lo local. Yeah, this is the kind of response we're going to get out of your icon. I'll make a motion. Is yeah, it appropriate lo local to governments have the opportunity periodically to, to make appointments to what is known as the, the Coastal Resources Advisory Council. We know that as CAMA. Uh, this is a committee that does research and makes recommendations to the CAMA board. Um, and so periodically there's, there's openings that uh, the, the, the CAMA reaches out to local governments and asks for um, us to make nominations. So they would actually make the appointment. Uh, we were approached by a couple of the towns in Dare County as well as Dare County themselves uh, that they collectively thought uh, that with Ike McCree's knowledge of, of local government and coastal government and coastal areas that he would be a, a good local government representative. And so they have told us that they would be submitting his name um, as one of these openings, and we have it in front of you tonight to consider if you would like to join with them and submit Ike's name for consideration as a member of the Coastal Resources Advisory Council. Uh, and I'm assuming that uh, Mr. McCree would accept, I mean, is interested in this position. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> Thank with you, that Mr. Scanlon. Said, Mr. Chairman, I would like to go ahead and um, nominate a point. Um, Ike McCree to join the um, CAMA. CAMA. CAMA Coastal <laughs> Resource Advisory Council nom as a nominee. <laughs> second. Uh, we have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. That was not smooth. That was perfect. <laughs> perfect. It's us. Well, right. Sure <laughs> moving, <laughs> moving on to consent agenda. Mr. Chairman, if I could just point out one item, number four, which is consideration approval of local emergency planning committee bylaws. I sit on that board, and I had the chance to meet with them, which also includes Curry Tech and Dare County officials. Mary Beth Nunes and her counterpart in Dare did a fantastic job in getting it ready to where instead of one of us acting alone, we can act as a group and hopefully smooth out any problems or work together so we can cope with any emergency that comes along our way. So I want to thank them. And I would ask for, along with the rest of the consent agenda, to be approved. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes <laughs> unanimously. Moving on to Commissioner's report. Mr. Hall? Commissioner Hall, I saw. Sorry. Nothing tonight. Commissioner White? Mm -hmm. Nothing for me this evening, thank you. Commissioner Beaumont? Nothing. Commissioner Etheridge? Commissioner Gilbert. Um, I just want to um, share one item, an event. Uh, the Moyoc Women's Club is doing a whiteout for hunger at the Sanctuary Vineyards February 3rd, and I would encourage anyone that wants to participate. It's for a great cause. Um, it's $50 per person, uh, but it is a sponsored um, event from the Moyoc Women's, and it's to white out hunger. So it's a night of dancing, great food, and um, an enjoyable venue at the Sanctuary Vineyards. February 3rd, and you can contact any Moyoc Women member or you can contact <coughs> myself. Commissioner Payment. I just wanted to thank everyone who um, helped out, participated <coughs> with the Wounded Warriors. Um, it was a big turnout. Um, the hunting and activities that took place and the people contributed to food and the, uh, the response along the highway uh, was just overwhelming and the support from the first responders and fire departments. So Again, I just want to thank everyone out there who helped support this and um, honored our wounded warriors out there that um, gave a lot for the freedom of this country and everyone in here. So that's all I had to say. Thank it you, Commissioner. It was a very moving <coughs> procession. I, I have to concur with you on that. It was, it was very touching and very moving. Uh, if I can, real quick, uh, I just want to talk about the citizens of Currituck. Uh, we sat and did, went to a work session today about the historic boat building 
and you can tell the passion that people have um, for the history of this county and the dedication and the time they're willing to put into a project like this. Just one example of all the things that make Currituck great. Um, proud to serve here, and uh, thank you very much. And that's all I have. And I'll hand it over to Mr. Scanlon for County Manager's report. Uh, nothing tonight, thank you. At this time, I would move to go into recess and move into closed session pursuant to GS 143-31811A3 to consult with county attorney and in order to preserve the county attorney client privilege. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you all very much.